So I'm looking out here, I noticed that I, I know most of you, I don't know all of you. Uh, so for those of you who I have not met, I look forward to doing so maybe afterwards. Um, as Nick mentioned, yes, I, uh, I do teach at the university. Uh, my, my wife Pam and I uh, have been living on PEI for 10 years now. Um, and uh, it, it has been a, a, a little bit of, a, of an adjustment, even after these 10 years, uh, getting used to the slow pace of, of PEI, just the general slowness of things. It's been, um, it's been a challenge. Uh, just for, for, for one example, um, uh, I was told uh, not long ago that uh, if I wanted an MRI, I would be waiting about two to three years, two to three years for that non-emergency non MRI. So I, I said, well, sign me up. Um, <laughs> will, will it be in the morning or the afternoon? <laughs> and they, they said, well, <laughs> three years. What is it? What difference does it make? I said, well, the plumber's coming in the morning. <laughs> I can't, I can't take credit for that joke. That, that's stolen from, from uh, Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. Yeah. <laughs> there is a good guy. Okay, well, uh, is, there, is there a Catholic political philosophy, as you'll uh, expect from uh, a philosopher himself? Uh, the answer is uh, not yes or no. It's, it's yes and no. And I hope to explain that uh, in the next 20 or 30 minutes. Um, one thing that you can look, if you paint with very broad brush strokes, if you look at the three great uh, monotheistic religions of Western civilization, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, one of the things that you'll notice is that there is a striking difference between, well, between all three of them, of course, but between Judaism and Islam on the one hand and, and Christianity on the other. Uh, Judaism and Islam are uh, primarily uh, religions of the law. To be a good Jew, to be a good Muslim, is to observe Jewish and Muslim law. Uh, even in the, the, the greatest intellectuals of the Middle Ages, uh, scholar of medieval intellectual history, the greatest intellectuals of medieval and Jewish uh, intellectual history are not theologians as they are in Christianity. They're, they're jurists. They're, they're, they're scholars trained in, this, in the science of jurisprudence. Now that is a marked difference between uh, those two religions on the one hand and Christianity on the other. Christianity certainly uh, pre presents certain legal uh, notions, but you would not say that it is primarily summed up as a law, uh, human or divine. Of course, the closest thing we get to a political philosophy in the New Testament is the famous passage uh, recorded in the Gospels where the, the, the Pharisees uh, ask Jesus, uh, should we be paying taxes to the emperor? And, and uh, of course, the, the answer is very famous. He asks for a coin, uh, asks whose, whose face it is on the coin, it is Caesar's face, it answers, well, you render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and render unto God the things that are God's. Now, of course, Christian theologians, it didn't take them long to apply that and to realize that unlike Ju Judaism and Islam, at least in their minds, uh, Christianity can flourish and survive, survive and even flourish in all kinds of legal systems. So long as that legal system does not require Christians to perform actions that are morally evil, uh, Christians can quite happily uh, and peacefully uh, coexist in, in any kind of regime and uh, uh, will be able to respect any kind of law, uh, so long as that law is roughly coherent with, with uh, the law of morality and as long as they're not forced to sacrifice to idols and things like that, then it, it should be just fine. This is the, when I said the, the answer to the question, is there a Catholic political philosophy? The answer is yes and no. I'm starting with the no. <laughs> okay. This is the no part. Uh, in that sense, there is no Catholic political philosophy. There is no 
ideally Catholic regime. Uh, you don't find any of, even in the most idealistic of, of Catholic political philosophers, you don't find any, any such thing. Uh, St. Augustine himself uh, says that you know, Christians should be able to flourish in all kinds of regimes. And we might say from this that uh, Catholics and Christians can very much in good conscience, I believe, very much in good conscience, be on either side of all kinds of public disagreements and public debates, and, and, and do so in good conscience. Catholics and Christians can disagree, for example, on uh, taxation. Uh, whether we want to, you know, what kind of tax code we want to have. Um, for example, whether we even want to have an income tax at all. I would go so far as to say that a Catholic in, in very good conscience could uh, suggest the abolition of the income tax and perhaps maybe in favor of a, of a consumption tax or something like that. Funding for public education. Uh, I think, again, in, in very much in good conscience, Catholics uh, can, Christians can, can be on either side of, of that debate, uh, whether and to what extent public education whether it's higher education or even primary education, should be funded by the public purse. The minimum wage. In my home country, the United States, there is a debate going on right now whether to increase the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Uh, there, are, there, are, there's, there's a strong Catholic movement behind this. And those, those people, I, I believe, are arguing very much in good faith, very much in, in good conscience. Whether, to, to, to lift the, the minimum wage to $15 an hour. There are also Catholics who advocate keeping the status quo. There are also Catholics who advocate abolishing the minimum wage. Now, if these Catholics who, who suggested abolishing the minimum wage were simply to say, well, yeah, forget the poor, who cares about them anyway, uh, that obviously would not be a very Catholic position, but, but the, way, the way that that belief is, is, uh, is explained is, is not that at all. Um, so the argument goes, uh, increasing the minimum wage or even having a minimum wage, although it helps many who are poor, it, uh, they argue, tends to harm the poorest of the poor. The minimum wage, they, they say, uh, is it has a general negative effect on employment, it's the, the, the level of employment itself. So there's more unemployed people. Moreover, uh, if you come from uh, an inner city, you have witnessed the inner city uh, life, you'll notice that large sections of, for example, the African American population are, uh, are quite arguably harmed by minimum wage legislation. Uh, just, I'll give you a 30 seconds to figure out how that might be. If you're a, if you're a manager of a, a Burger King and you have the chance to, um, to hire the, uh, the, 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 the white kid from, uh, with, the, with the, the high school diploma or the African American kid who comes maybe from the wrong side of the tracks, uh, if you have to pay them the same, you'll hire the, the white kid every time. Uh, you just want to take the risk, um, taking away the imposing a minimum wage uh, takes away the only card that that African American young man uh, has to play, namely the fact that he's willing to work for a, a lesser wage. Uh, so that that would be one example of of an argument. You may, you may disagree with that assessment of things, but uh, you could say that a Catholic could certainly make that argument very much in good faith, uh, because. Of, of his or her concern for the poor, not out of a sort of a desire to dismiss, dismiss them. And even, uh, you might say, even the regime itself is something that is really open to question, open to debate when it comes to Catholic uh, social philosophy and, and theology. Whether we live in a democracy or uh, a monarchy or a aristocracy of some kind, uh, the, the, the Catholic position on that is simply that uh, all of those regimes uh, can be very just and legitimate regimes uh, so long as, as they are ruled consistently with principles of, basic principles of morality and, and political philosophy. 
And uh, you know, so that there is no, there is no uh, prejudice in favor of one kind of regime or another. Uh, we do find in, in, in the most recent encyclicals of the, of the, of the church a slight uh, gravitation in, in favor of democracy, but not, that it's, but not that democracy is the only legitimate regime, it just happens to be the, the regime that at present uh, is best at securing fundamental uh, uh, principles of morality and human rights. But it is not in any, by any stretch of the imagination the only legitimate regime that, that we could, in which we could live. So instead of offering a strict, um, and, uh, a strict set of, of public policy suggestions, the Catholic Church is always very uh, happy to, to, to say that it's, it's no expert when it comes to questions of economics or questions of public policy. Uh, to say, no, we're not, you know, we're not really making judgments about that, whether we should have a minimum wage, although you know, the American bishops might say this or that. The church as a, as a whole will not, uh, will not weigh in on those, those uh, detailed kinds of questions. Instead, what the church does is to present to us certain fundamental principles of how civil society should be organized and moral principles to which civil society should adhere. Many of you will recognize some of these principles, but I'd just like to mention uh, what I consider to be the, some of the most important. The first, of course, is the principle of human dignity. Human dignity. What is the idea of human dignity? Well, it's, it's quite straightforward. It's, it's the idea that it comes from the Latin word dignus. Dignus, which means worth. Worth. And it means quite simply this, that human beings, simply insofar as they are human beings, have an inherent worth. It is not on the basis of their nationality. It is not on the basis of their, uh, their sex. It is not on the basis of their uh, sexual orientation. It is not on the basis of their race. It is not on the basis of their income level or even their usefulness to society, or even their usefulness to themselves. It is simply on the virt by virtue of the fact that they are human beings, that they have this inherent worth. This, of course, provides the basis for the church's commitment to human rights. So many of you will be recognizing, yeah, this is kind of what the idea of human rights is all about. Rights that belong to us simply by virtue of the fact that we belong to the human species, that we are created in the image and likeness of God. The next principle is maybe quite arguably the most important principle of Catholic uh, political thought, and that is the notion of the common good. The common good. This is something that is very often overlooked. The common good can be uh, it's the kind of phrase and word that can be thrown around and really mean anything that the person using it wants it to mean. But what I'd like to maybe lay out for you today is just a, a very quick um, distinction in the notion of the common good between other competing understandings of something similar. The common good, according to the, the notion of the common good, we are members of a political society that is greater than the sum total of all of our individual interests. And that's a mouthful, I realize. We are members of a political society that is greater than the sum total of our individual interests. What that means is that the common good is distinguishable from what we might call a partnership. A partnership. What is a partnership? A partnership is any time individuals come together for their mutual advantage. There's nothing wrong with partnerships. They happen all the time. The most common would be a business partnership. Partnerships occur when individuals, two or more individuals, realize that their own individual interests can be furthered better by cooperating with one another. 
Now, this again, there's nothing wrong with partnerships. They, they happen all the time. Um, uh, however, the, the church would point out again and again, a partnership is not a political society. Somewhere along the way, human beings realize that they are part of something that is bigger than themselves. Something worth sacrificing for. Something worth dying for, perhaps even. This is what makes for a political society, because there is a common good, a good that we as members of, of political society share with one another. My neighbor, my fellow citizen, is not simply a partner who is trying to get something out of this partnership, just like I'm trying to get something out of it. But I have, a, once I'm in political society, once I share a common good with that person, I recognize that person's good, that person's interests, that person's hopes, that person's dreams, as equally valid, as equally worthy of pursuit as my own. It is for the first time, as Aristotle famously says in his politics, uh, once, in very primitive societies, people just lived in villages. Those were partnerships. They came together for the sake of survival. But as villages grew bigger, and villages started to combine with other villages. Somewhere along the way, the village becomes a polis, a political society, and for the first time, you have not only a partner in that partnership, but you, for the first time, you have a citizen. A citizen. The Romans were very aware of this distinction. They learned it from, from Cicero. They would go around calling each other citizen on the street. <laughs> To call attention to this fact. Common good. Another principle, of course, that is uh, equally important, look at my watch here, is the principle of solidarity. Now, sometimes this principle gets sort of lumped in with the principle of the common good. Uh, and, and rightfully so, it is, it is very similar, and there's a lot of overlap between the principle of solidarity and the principle of the common good. It is closely related with the common good, but what I would say makes, makes for a, the uniqueness of the principle of solidarity is that it, it goes beyond the political society. It goes beyond the polis. We are called as Catholics to be in solidarity, not only with the, the, the fellow members of our, of our political regime, but with those who are in other political regimes as well, especially the poor. Especially the poor. The, um, not the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the, uh, um, the document that on, on Catholic social teaching, the compendium to the Catholic Doctrine on Social Teaching puts the, the, uh, the, the notion of solidarity like this, and I, I won't, this is the one and only quotation that I'll read to you tonight, so bear with me. Uh, it says this, solidarity is an authentic moral virtue, not a feeling of vague compassion or shallow distress at the misfortunes of so many people, both near and far. On the contrary, it is a firm and, pres and, and persevering determination to commit oneself to the common good. That is to say, the good of all and of each individual, because we are all really responsible for all. Solidarity rises to the rank of, fundamental, of a fundamental social virtue, since it places itself in the sphere of justice. It is a virtue directed par excellence to the common good, and is found in a commitment to the good of one's neighbor with the readiness in the gospel sense to lose oneself for the sake of the other instead of exploiting him and to serve him instead of oppressing him for one's own advantage. I, I think those, those words could be meditated upon for, for very long. Those are very powerful words. The last principle I'd like to mention today um, is the principle of subsidiarity. The principle of subsidiarity. This is something, unlike, for example, the principle of the common good and human dignity, 
that really has only developed over the past century or so. The point of the principle of subsidiarity is this, that within political society, there exist legitimate sub-societies, or what uh, the social encyclicals call subsidiary societies, other than the state, other than the state. And these subsidiary societies are themselves, like individual persons, bearers of rights and responsibilities. Bearers of rights and responsibilities. You could think of a lot of examples here. These could include guilds, charitable organizations, advocacy groups, universities, sports leagues, orchestras, and perhaps most importantly, churches and families. These are subsidiary societies. Now what makes this principle such a point of emphasis in the last hundred years or so is that modern political thought, modern political philosophy, beginning with the philosophy of Thomas Hobbes, the, the great English philosopher, begins with the claim that the state does not share authority with any of these groups underneath it. Hobbes was very clear on this in, in his Leviathan. The state has absolute authority. Either it has absolute authority or is it, it is, in a sense, illegitimate. All or nothing. If these, uh, Hobbes would have said, if these smaller groups have any authority whatsoever over their members, it is only the authority that the state allows them to have. This is a very, very powerfully modern notion. It is one of the notions upon which the modern French state is based, for example. Look, for example, in um, section three of the famous Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, the document upon which the modern French state is based. It reads as follows. The principle of all sovereignty resides essentially in the nation. The principle of all sovereignty resides essentially in the nation. No body nor individual may exercise any authority which does not proceed directly from the nation. It is precisely in, in response to this profoundly modern notion that the principle of subsidiarity is such a point of emphasis in the last hundred years or so. In fact, uh, just as a historical note, before the 20th century, nobody ever talked about Catholic social teaching. It was never, it was never a, even a, a word that was used. It was not doctrina socialis, as we talk about now. It's doctrina civilis. Civil doctrine. The, the, the word was changed from civilis to socialis precisely in order to call attention to the fact that, to use a more general word, society, to call attention to the fact that there are other societies other than the civitas, the, the state, the nation. So this, again, this is a very important, this is a very important concept. Perhaps needless to say at this point, Catholicism is opposed to this modern notion of the absolute authority of the state. The state, though sovereign, though sovereign, does not have absolute authority over all of these groups under it. Now somebody might say, well, you know, what, what state, what state tries to exercise, what modern state could possibly exercise direct authority over every little group that's underneath it. That's, that's, I mean, that's not even practical anyway. But that would be, but that would be very, uh, that would be to miss the point. It's not that the state allows lesser societies to run themselves because it can't practically do it itself. That would be to say that, that authority just kind of devolves down from the state. <coughs> Devolution is merely uh, a practice. The principle, 
The principle is subsidiarity. It is, it is the principle um, that the state doesn't merely allow these lesser societies to have their own authority structures and to exist and to flourish, but that it actually recognizes that they have a legitimate claim to that authority already. Already. So perhaps the, the best example of this, even before the term subsidiarity was coined, is Pope Leo XIII's, for example, defense of workers' rights to form societies, unions of their own, and that these, these, uh, these societies must be allowed to exist. The state does not have the authority simply to, to take away workers' rights to unionize. So again, the point is that these societies must have their, and be allowed to have, their own mo modes of authority. The guild leader over the members, the parents over the children, the abbot over the monks, the pastor over the congregation. The principle of subsidiarity, uh, of course, and as, as Pope John Paul II uh, himself argues in uh, his, his own greatest social encyclical, the principle of subsidiarity is most likely to be respected in democratic societies. That is the society that will most be, be most likely to respect this very important principle. But one thing to, 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 to respect, and this is something that easily gets lost, for a democracy to respect the principle of subsidiarity is to recognize that those subsidiary institutions, those subsidiary societies, need not themselves be democratic. Those subsidiary societies need not be democratic. In fact, I, I, and this is kind of a paradox. Part of what it means to be an authentic democracy is to recognize the legitimacy of subsidiary societies, many of which shouldn't be democratic. From a Catholic perspective, you know, the family and the church would be two examples of this. So, is there a Catholic political philosophy? Yes, there is, and no, there isn't. I'd like to be, perhaps conclude with uh, you know, a philosopher that I uh, think is always the most helpful on these matters, Thomas Aquinas, who gives us a very, I think, exactly perfect analogy here. He talks about um, political society is like, uh, he, he likens the, 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 the science of, of political philosophy to that of architecture, building a house. And he says that you know, having, having political societies is very much like architecture. There are certain things, there are certain things that you cannot have or sorry, that, that, you, that you must have if you're building a house. Right? Some, some way to get in and out, some kind of foundation, <laughs> some sort of roof, uh, only a few things. You could probably name you know, six or seven things that you cannot build a house and forget. Other than that, there are a wide variety of different kinds of things that you can have in the house. A spiral staircase, a straight staircase, you can build on a slab, you can dig a foundation, uh, you could have one kind of siding or another, you could heat it in one way or another. There's an almost infinite number of var variations. Political society is very much the same way, says Thomas. There's only a few things that just societies must have. Other than that, you can make decisions based on prudence, based on, based on cultural, historical situation that you're in. And other than that, um, Political society uh, can be very much left up to the to the wisdom of legislators and judges. So, is there a Catholic political philosophy? I think we have to say both yes and no. And that's where I'll close for tonight because I think I've already gone over. So, thank you very much.